I have been married to Bianca for six years, she was once a favored child of the heavens, but unexpectedly fell from grace, I stayed by her side, unwavering, finally, her new work, Muse, brought her fame overnight, and the genius painter returned to her peak, a reporter asked her, who is the man in the painting? She smiled gently, he is the love of my life, that day, I received her divorce papers, chapter 1, the genius painter Bianca returned to the peak with her new work, Muse, after years of silence, at the art exhibition, all her works were sold at high prices, except for the most eye-catching piece, Muse, it was a lifelike oil painting, under the soft moonlight, the lake sparkled with light, and a young man in white stood by the lake, holding flowers and smiling enchantingly, she said, this is not for sale, no amount of money can buy it, a reporter asked her, who is the man in the painting, she smiled gently, he is the love of my life, that day, I received the divorce papers from Bianca, the money and house were all left to me, she walked away with nothing, I watched the live video online and called her, congratulations, the exhibition was a success, her tone was indifferent, it has nothing to do with you, how could it be unrelated, I raised my voice, questioning, aren't you walking away with nothing, the income from the exhibition is also part of our marital assets, we should account for that too, she sneered, Leonardo, you're really money minded, I chuckled, money is more reliable than people, she was silent for a moment, I'll have the lawyer send you a new agreement tomorrow, I agreed readily, all right, let's cut all ties, let's not, before she could finish, I hung up the phone, feeling that even listening to another second was a waste, it's hard to imagine that just four months ago, I was praying to spend a lifetime with her, hand in hand until we were old, chapter 2, that day was our sixth wedding anniversary, Valentine's Day, I secretly flew back from France, wanting to surprise Bianca, when I arrived downstairs at the apartment, I saw a young man standing alone in the snow with his luggage, his hands were red from the cold, but his voice on the phone was full of joy, guess where I am, I don't know what the person on the other end said, but the young man's face relaxed, and he said warmly, I missed you, so I came to see you, I recalled the days in college when Bianca and I were in a long distance relationship, when longing became unbearable, we would also buy a ticket and head towards each other without hesitation, moved by this scene, I took out my phone to call Bianca, in the next moment, I saw her coming out of the building, she ran straight towards the young man, throwing herself into his arms, he held her tightly, as if he had caught a rare treasure, in the quiet, snowy night, they kissed passionately and for a long time, I stood frozen, watching their overwhelming love, when Bianca looked up, she finally noticed me standing a short distance away, dumbfounded, I trudged forward with my luggage, the few steps feeling like crossing mountains and rivers, her first reaction was to stand protectively in front of him, the young man was confused and leaned down to whisper in her ear, who is he? I didn't know what expression to make as I stood in front of them and said flatly, I'm her husband, the boy, hearing this, quickly stepped in front of Bianca, adopting a protective stance, this is my fault, don't blame her, I laughed dryly and looked at the woman behind him, whose face was a mix of emotions, aren't you going to say something? Bianca pursed her lips, her gaze darkened, as if she had made some sort of decision, she stepped forward to stand beside the boy, holding his hand tightly, and said to me, it's exactly as you see, perhaps the snowstorm was too strong, freezing my brain, there were no questions, no arguments, I quietly turned and went home, Bianca didn't follow, chapter 3, the window on the balcony at home was wide open, and the cold wind was rushing in, I could almost imagine Bianca receiving the call, opening the window, and seeing the young man standing gracefully below, her face filled with both surprise and joy, the easel beside it was still set up, the unfinished painting on the paper catching my eye, the protagonist was clearly the young man from earlier, he was holding roses, his clothes fluttering in the wind, with a shy smile on his face, the kind one has when seeing their lover, once upon a time, Bianca had also painted me with such care, I met her when we were 16, in high school, she was well known then, a rich girl, a top student, the school beauty, surrounded by various auras, I came from a rural area, we were worlds apart and wouldn't have crossed paths, but fate made us desk mates, I wasn't good at English, and my Mandarin had a bit of an accent, so I was often teased by classmates, she stood up for me and patiently taught me, the girl always spoke with a smile, a slight grin would make her face bloom like a thousand flowers, I secretly loved her for three years, never daring to hope that she might like me too, after the college entrance exams, she didn't choose Peking or Tsinghua as everyone expected but chose an art academy instead, she said painting was her lifelong dream, and her family supported her, she had the privilege to be willful, but I didn't, with my grades at the time, the best option was to go to a school in the south, thousands of miles away from her, that summer, 
She came to my small mountain village to do some field work and asked me to be her guide. We watched the flowers on the slopes, the birds in the woods, the clouds in the sky together. On the last day, my mother brought out homemade plum wine for her to taste. I couldn't stop her. She drank a glass and got so drunk she couldn't tell north from south. She fell into my arms, blushing and talking nonsense. She said, Leonardo, I like you. While helping her pack, I found that all her paintings were of me. When it was time to leave, I took her to the station, walking slowly all the way, wanting to ask, does what you said last night still count? Finally, I couldn't hold back, Bianca, if I confess now, would it be too late? She looked at me, tears of joy in her eyes, it's not too late, as long as it's you, it's never too late, we got together. During the four years of our long-distance relationship in college, I gave her all the love and security she needed, making sure she knew clearly that she was the favored one. She often laughed at me without reservation. Leonardo, you love me so much, I let her tease me, and when she had enough, I would gently kiss her. From 18 to 28, we loved each other for 10 years. Countless yesterdays flashed through my mind. Finally, the suppressed emotions erupted, and I tore the painting to shreds. Chapter 4 I sat alone on the sofa until dawn. When Bianca returned, she carried a scent that was unfamiliar, like the smell of hotel shower gel. When she saw me, there was a hint of guilt in her eyes. I'm sorry, my eyes were bloodshot, and my voice was hoarse when I spoke. When did it start? She candidly told me about their past. The boy's name was Elias. He was a senior at the art academy, also studying painting. She met him last year when she returned to her alma mater for an anniversary. He admired Bianca's talent and was her loyal and passionate admirer. Their souls were in harmony. They often reminisced about Van Gogh under the stars and chatted about Monet's water lilies by the lakeside. She said they were rare confidants and truly in love. Our ten years together couldn't compare to their ten months of acquaintance. When Bianca talked about him, her eyes were filled with affection, and her expression was gentle. She emphasized it many times. I really love him. I was mad with jealousy. He's just a college student interfering in someone else's marriage. What kind of good person could he be? Isn't he just after money? Bianca looked at me, her gaze growing colder. Leonardo, he's not like you. All you see is money. Her words deeply hurt me. Bianca was a natural romantic always regarding money as dirt. In college, she was already a somewhat famous painter. Many people offered big money for her paintings, but she refused them all. Her paintings were always only for those she deemed worthy. But the unexpected happened. The year she graduated, her family went bankrupt. Her parents were in debt, and they both died in a car accident while being chased by creditors. She was trapped at home by the creditors. I secretly climbed over the wall to find her, held her, and said, Bianca, marry me. I had no status, no wealth but I had a heart that was unwavering. I consulted a lawyer. Children weren't responsible for their parents' debts, but there were many creditors, and their relentless harassment could ruin Bianca's life. With my mother's consent, I took out all the family savings and raised some money to negotiate, helping Bianca pay off the debt with the least cost. After we got married, life was tough. The rental house leaked wind and rain, and during typhoons, it turned into a small pond. In winter, the wind blew through, making it impossible to sleep. We would hold each other tightly. Talking through the night, Bianca tried to find those who had wanted to buy her paintings, but all she got was humiliation. She had been too proud before and had offended people. Now that she needed money, she was turned away everywhere. I felt sorry for her and forbade her from selling her paintings. To make her life more comfortable, I worked three jobs a day. If I made a hundred dollars, I would give her ninety-nine. Once, I had a brief episode of blindness from anemia, and she was in a panic taking care of me, her voice trembling as she called my name. She cried uncontrollably in front of me. Not marrying you would be my lifelong regret, but marrying you and dragging you down makes me even more desperate. I scolded her. Fool. I never thought of you as a burden. At that time, I felt very happy. Chapter 5. Let's get a divorce. Bianca's words pulled me back to reality. Her attitude was resolute as she said, I can agree to anything you want. My heart twisted in pain. What I want, don't you already know? She didn't understand and simply said, You set the terms. I laughed out loud. You're really willing to give up everything for him, huh? Bianca lowered her eyes and dropped a bombshell. Leonardo, I'm pregnant with his child. My mind went blank, and my heart shattered into pieces. I thought of the child we once had. In the second year of our marriage, Bianca got pregnant. I was overjoyed, but she secretly had an abortion without telling me. With tears in her eyes, she said to me, Leonardo, we can't afford to raise a child. Don't bring him into this world to suffer. Bianca apologized to me countless times. I held her forcing a smile to comfort her. It's okay. We can have children in the future. That day, she held me tightly, whispering in my ear, I love you. That sentence was like a spell. 
binding our hearts together during the days when we had nothing. After that, I worked even harder. I became very good at reading people's expressions and gradually made a name for myself in the workplace. My boss was in the import-export business and often needed to entertain clients. I could hold my liquor, so he liked to take me along and even gave me extra bonuses. Every day, I would come home and vomit until the sky spun. Bianca would stay by my side all night, taking care of me. She always said, don't ruin your health for a little bit of money. I dismissed her concerns, we need to think long term. Over time, I built up quite a network and later I started my own wine business. I was constantly traveling, entertaining clients, and was incredibly busy, Bianca said again. We have enough money now, you don't need to work so hard, but I had two dreams that I had to realize. I always believed that Bianca's future would be full of stars and oceans. I wanted her to paint freely, without having to give up her lifelong passion because of mundane life. I also hoped that the child we lost could come back to us soon. Heaven rewarded my hard work, our life really did start to improve. In the fifth year of our marriage, we had a house and savings. I finally mustered the courage to suggest, honey, let's have a child. To my surprise, she wasn't very enthusiastic and only said, Leonardo, now is not the right time. She told me she was in a creative slump and hadn't produced a painting she was satisfied with in a long time. I tried to comfort her, your paintings are amazing. My friends all love them. Mr. Zhang even said he wants to buy one of your paintings for his new house next month. Bianca scoffed. What do those Philistines know about art? I was stunned, realizing she had misspoken. She quickly apologized and explained that she didn't look down on business people. She just wanted recognition from professionals. She buried her head deep in my shoulder, whispering, I'm just losing confidence. Perhaps by then, cracks had already started to form in our relationship, but I was too busy to pay much attention to the changes in her. Not long after, Bianca's mood began to improve, and she often had a smile on her face. I thought she had broken through her slump, but it turned out her soul had found a new home. The young man she loved was in the prime of his life, untouched by the dust of time. He would describe her paintings as the flowers of spring, the rain of summer, the wind of autumn, and the snow of winter, the most beautiful things in the world. And I, a businessman driven by profit, reeked of money, unable to resonate with her. Leonardo, I'm sorry, Bianca's voice echoed in my ears. I was silent for a long time, as long as the time we had spent together, but in the end, I couldn't let go. I won't divorce you, I heard myself say. Bianca coldly replied, it's not up to you, in that moment, I heard the sound of love dying, chapter 6, at the height of the tension between Bianca and me, my mother was hospitalized, the doctor said it was terminal cancer, my father died young, and my mother had endured a lifetime of hardships, when I got married, I was overwhelmed with my own problems, and she insisted on living alone in the countryside so as not to be a burden on us, later, when our financial situation improved slightly, I still didn't have time to be by her side, I felt deeply guilty, knowing that I had never let her enjoy even a day of happiness in her life. She lay on the hospital bed, emaciated and frail, asking me, where's Bianca? Forcing myself to smile, I cheerfully replied, she's been very busy lately, preparing for an art exhibition. I told my mother that Bianca had gained the admiration of the great art master Luis, and that she was on the verge of achieving her dreams. She smiled with relief, Bianca has finally fulfilled her wish, your life will only get better from here and now I can rest easy. I hastily made up an excuse to leave the room, unable to stop the tears from flowing. Fate really loves to toy with me. Shortly after our fight, Bianca received news from France, the reclusive Louise had suddenly expressed interest in her paintings and wanted to meet her. A rare talent had finally found a mentor, and the two hit it off, lamenting that they hadn't met sooner. Bianca considered the young man her lucky star. She said it was he who helped her rediscover her passion for painting, leading to this opportunity. She would never know that it was I who had painstakingly arranged this chance for her. And now, it was merely a wedding dress tailored for someone else. I splashed some water on my face and returned to the room. My mother suddenly said she wanted to see Bianca. I couldn't refuse her, so I finally reached out to Bianca. Perhaps it was my pride, but I didn't want to show any weakness in front of her. When I spoke, it was in the tone of a negotiation. Bianca, let's make a deal. I'll agree to the divorce, but you have to play along with me for one last act. Okay. She agreed readily and without hesitation, even though it was the answer I wanted. My heart twisted again, disappointment, anger, sadness, negative emotions swarmed me like a thousand poisonous insects, devouring me bit by bit. I thought I might be going mad. Chapter 7 Bianca arrived on time. We hadn't seen each other for half a month, and she was even more graceful and radiant than before, clearly doing well. We both suppressed our emotions, pretending to be affectionate as we walked into the hospital room. My mother weak and barely breathing, lay on the bed. When she saw us, 
Her dull eyes lit up for a moment, and she struggled to sit up and talk to us. She urged me to cherish my wife and not to let her down. She also reminded Bianca to live well with me. My mother wasn't usually one for many words, but this time, it seemed like she had an endless amount to say. I knew she was simply worried. Bianca responded to all her advice with a simple, yes. Finally, my mother placed our hands together and said, you must live well together in this life. I couldn't hold back my tears. I really wanted to tell her that once she was gone, I would have no family left in this world. But now, the words were stuck in my throat, and I couldn't say anything. Bianca naturally patted my back, her gentle gaze reminiscent of the girl she was at 18. I felt a bit dazed, and when we left the room, our hands were still clasped together. Shamefully, I realized that I still craved that little bit of warmth in my palm. Can we not get divorced? The ridiculous thought swirled in my mind. My phone suddenly rang, and Bianca let go of my hand. I looked up at her in confusion, but the girl's shadow had already disappeared. She walked aside to answer the call, and snippets of her conversation drifted into my ears, just everyday words. I didn't know what the person on the other end said, but she blushed and scolded, shameless. Then she said sweetly, I'll be home soon. As I watched this woman, I suddenly felt she was a complete stranger. When she finished the call and saw my dazed expression, she frowned and asked, You look terrible, are you sick? As she spoke, she reached out to touch my forehead, but I instinctively pulled away. We both froze. Her hand lingered in the air for a moment before she awkwardly said, We can wait until your mother's health improves before finalizing the divorce. My muddled mind finally cleared, and I nodded in agreement. Chapter 8 My mother's condition didn't improve, and her memory began to fail. Every now and then, she would ask to see Bianca. For three months, Bianca and I continued our charade, with her accompanying me to listen to my mother's repeated advice. Every time Bianca came to the hospital, Elias would call frequently, and later, he simply started coming along, the day they showed up hand in hand. I lost my temper and blocked their way. Get him as far away from here as possible, Bianca tried to explain, saying he would wait nearby and wouldn't let my mother see him. I refused to compromise, sneering, showing a little less affection won't kill you, the boy who had been silent until then, suddenly stepped forward, furious, aren't you going too far, you're getting a divorce, so stop finding ways to torment her, he grew more agitated, nearly coming to blows with me, she's been so busy preparing for the exhibition that she barely has time to eat, I'm here because I'm worried about her, Bianca took his hand, gently soothing him, don't get upset, you'll scare our baby, Elias glared at me, then looked down at her, but I can't stand seeing you like this, the sight of their affection made my stomach churn, I scoffed, Bianca and I aren't divorced yet. What you're doing is called cheating, you know. Or maybe it's just a rental. Paper use. Bianca was stunned. Tears welling up in her eyes. Leonardo, have you gone mad? Elias gritted his teeth, glaring at me. A grown man speaking so harshly. No wonder your wife doesn't want you. I'm done tolerating this. She can either leave with me now or stay with you. But she can't have it both ways. He then turned to look at the woman beside him. His gaze earnest. There was no suspense. Bianca left with her lover. Hand in hand, that day, my mother was actually in good spirits. I lied, saying Bianca had an emergency, and she didn't press the issue, but by evening, she suddenly fell into a coma, and the doctor issued a critical condition notice. When she regained consciousness, she asked to see Bianca again. In a panic, I called her, and it took a long time for her to answer. I squatted on the ground, holding my head, and asked, Can you come? She replied bluntly, It's too late. I grew desperate. My mother is dying. Her tone was impatient. I suggest you stop joking about things like that. Shocked and furious, I demanded. Do you think I'd joke about my mother's life? She was silent for a moment, then said, It's raining tonight, I'm pregnant, and he won't let me go out. Swallowing my pride, I nearly begged. Ask him to bring you over, or I'll have a friend drive you here. I promise you'll be safe. Okay. Ten years together, I'm begging you. Help me just this once, she sighed. I'll discuss it with him. Clinging to that sliver of hope, I babbled. Today's argument was my fault. Okay, if you come tonight, I'll agree to whatever you want. All right. Thunder and lightning filled the sky, burying the sound of my dignity shattering in the darkness. From the other end of the line came a low, hushed voice, tinged with something sensual. Bianca let out a soft, stifled moan, then scolded lightly. Stop it. The call abruptly ended, and when I tried to call back, there was no answer. That night, she never showed up. My mother noticed something was off and asked cautiously. Are you and Bianca having a fight? I forced a casual tone. No, she's on her way. But her brows furrowed deeper, and she insisted I call her, saying she wanted to talk to Bianca. But by then, Bianca's phone was off. Later, my mother's consciousness began to fade, and she muttered incessantly, Son, 
if you're not happy, how can I rest in peace? As dawn broke, she passed away, her hand gripping mine tightly, her eyes refusing to close. My world collapsed into ruins. Chapter 9 I took my mother's ashes back to the countryside for burial. Bianca came along. She lowered her head, her face full of guilt. I'm sorry, I didn't know that night. I motioned her out, too exhausted to argue. Don't call her mom, you're not worthy. Leonardo, can't you speak properly? Bianca's voice softened. I just wanted to see if there was anything I could do to help. I kept my face cold. There's nothing you can do. She refused to leave, staying by my side the entire time. The funeral wasn't elaborate. Just a few neighbors from the village helped out. Once everything was done and the people had left, I finally calmed down and said to Bianca, let's talk. She nodded in agreement. My tone was icy. Let's get the divorce papers done quickly. She frowned slightly and tried to change the subject. I want to explain what happened that night. I don't want to hear it. I cut her off and continued. You're the one at fault. I want you to leave with nothing. I know exactly what the assets are. So don't try any tricks or negotiate with me. Otherwise, I'll make sure everyone knows about your affair. Bianca looked at me with sorrowful eyes. Leonardo, the assets were earned by you. Do you really think I'd fight you for them? I let out a cold laugh. You can never truly know someone. She looked disappointed. You weren't like this before. People change. I said. The Bianca I knew wouldn't have treated me this way either. A long silence was broken by the ringing of a phone. It was Elias calling. She stepped outside to take the call. I immediately shut the door. And she didn't come back. That night, I lay on the bed in the old house and had a long dream. I dreamed of myself at 22, bringing Bianca home against all odds and telling my mother that I was going to marry her. The creditors tracked us down, causing a ruckus every day. My mother hid her in a room, instructing, Bianca, don't go out, leave everything to Leo. I dealt with them alone for months, finally settling everything before the new year. It snowed on New Year's Eve, exhausted. I made my way back home from out of town. Snowflakes fell on me, layer after layer, but I didn't feel cold. The moment I got home, she was the first to open the door and rushed into my arms. I staggered a bit but held her firmly. I never want to be apart from you again. Bianca's tearful yet joyful expression was so endearing. I was about to respond when the scene suddenly spun around. I stood there, dumbfounded, watching her run into someone else's arms in the snow and kiss him passionately. Bianca, Bianca. I kept calling her name, but she couldn't hear me. Suddenly, everything went dark, and I felt a strong sense of falling, as if I were plummeting endlessly into an abyss. The next day, I woke up with a high fever. My mind clouded. I lay in bed for two days, feeling like I was on the verge of death. One day, I received a message from a business partner, there was a problem with the wine supply, and I had lost a lot of money. I jumped up in shock, quickly dressed, and rushed out the door. Then, I went to the doctor alone, took my medicine, and recovered. Chapter 10 These past four months drained me of so much energy that I made several mistakes in business, leaving me too busy even to grieve. The next time I heard Bianca's name was in the news about her painting exhibition's overwhelming success, the notoriously demanding art master, Mr. Luis, praised her highly, saying that she had indeed been a hidden gem all these years. Even though he had been in seclusion, the elderly man publicly appeared at her exhibition, declaring Bianca the most talented young female painter he had ever encountered. The industry was shaken, the media caught wind, and reports flooded the internet. Bianca, already strikingly beautiful gained so much attention that her popularity eclipsed even that of the most famous celebrities. The hashtag hashtag goddess painter Bianca hashtag shot to the top of trending topics. All her works sold out instantly, with someone even offering 10 million to buy the most prominent piece of the exhibition. Muse. Bianca refused. Sensing a juicy story, reporters asked who the man in the painting was. She boldly declared her love. My college roommate, Victor, forwarded me the video and asked, why would Bianca say that? I was holding the divorce papers I had just received and replied, it's nothing. She's fallen in love with someone else, and we're getting a divorce. Victor immediately called, his voice filled with anger. Weren't things fine four months ago? Doesn't she know what you went through in France for her? I responded calmly, even if she knew, it wouldn't change anything. For our sixth anniversary, I wanted to give Bianca a special gift. I knew the person she admired most was a painter named Luis. This old man had rarely appeared in public when he was younger. And now, in his seclusion, he was nearly impossible to find. I used every connection and resource I had to get a lead. Albeit a dubious one, someone had reportedly seen him browsing street art stalls in the Marais district of Paris. So, I took a trip to France under the pretense of a business trip. It was my first time abroad, in a foreign land where I knew no one. On the first day, my luggage was stolen. I chased after the thief but was lured into a secluded alley. A group of street thugs was waiting there, outnumbered. I was beaten down to the ground. Just before I lost consciousness, 
I heard someone shout something in French, and the thugs quickly scattered. I woke up in the hospital with only minor injuries. It was Victor who had saved me. We were college roommates, and a year after I got married, he moved abroad. We had gradually lost touch, so it was surprising to reunite this way. He helped me a lot, taking care of me while I recovered from my injuries. He asked me, aren't you going to tell Bianca? I shook my head. At that time, Bianca often locked herself in her studio, seemingly in a critical phase. I didn't want to worry her. As soon as I felt a little better, I rushed out, spending every day waiting in the Marais district. I had no guarantee of finding Luis, but I didn't want to leave any stone unturned. When Victor learned of my mission, his eyes widened in disbelief, looking at me like I was an idiot. Then, with exaggerated mockery, he said, you just keep spoiling your wife like that. Someday she'll be completely spoiled. I rolled my eyes at him. I'm willing. We ended up playfully wrestling, just like our college days. I made a deal with a street vendor in the Marais district, renting his stall and displaying several of Bianca's paintings from different periods in the most prominent spot, praying each day for a stroke of luck. It was winter at the time, and every moment I wasn't sleeping, I was out in the cold. The wind so harsh it gave me frostbite on my ears. Victor would always buy me medicine while grumbling. You're asking for it. After three weeks in France, with Valentine's Day approaching, I decided to return home. This trip was indeed impulsive, and it was only natural that I didn't find him. I thought I'd wait for more concrete information before making another attempt. But fate had other plans. On the last day, as I was packing up, Mr. Luis appeared and was immediately drawn to a piece Bianca had painted when she was 18. He smiled and asked me who the artist was. I proudly told him Bianca's name. He pointed to the not for sale tag on the painting and asked, not for sale. I nodded. This is my personal collection. Then why display it? He asked. I replied. I want more people to see what an extraordinary artist she is. He seemed thoughtful as he studied the painting for a long time before leaving with a smile. I knew about Mr. Luis's temperament. He was known for discovering and nurturing many unknown young artists who are now industry giants. I knew that Bianca's opportunity had arrived. Things went more smoothly than I had anticipated. I thought to myself, someone with talent like hers was destined to shine. I was genuinely happy for Bianca. She was one step closer to her dream. On our wedding anniversary, I lied to Bianca saying I couldn't come back from France, wanting to surprise her, but her reaction was indifferent. She only said, I see. At first, I felt a bit disappointed, but as I boarded the plane, I saw that she had posted on her social media, longing that spans mountains and seas, the knot in my heart immediately unraveled, and on the way back, I was still daydreaming about our bright future together. How ironic it was that her longing had already turned to someone else. Chapter 11. Don't you feel resentful? Victor asked me. I answered calmly. Of course I do, but what's more important now is to live my life well. He sighed in relief. Leonardo, sometimes you're terrifyingly rational. I laughed. Thanks for the compliment. After hanging up, the room fell silent again. I replayed the video. Bianca smiled gently and affectionately at the camera, saying that the boy in the painting was the love of her life. It still made me uncomfortable. I called Bianca and told her that the income from the art exhibition should be considered marital property, and if we divorced, it should go to me. She mocked me but agreed. It seemed she was really eager to marry her beloved. I tried to think of that trip to France as an investment, and now that I had gained substantial wealth, it wasn't a total loss. Thinking this way, I gradually made peace with myself. Money really is a good thing. That night, I treated myself to the best wine and drank until late. The next morning, I was woken by a phone call. Victor's voice sounding both distant and close. Open the door. I stumbled to the door and opened it. Seeing him standing there with luggage, his face stern, such a big thing happened and you didn't tell me. That's not what friends do. I stood there in shock. He opened his arms and smiled. I'm here to keep you company, buddy. I hugged him, feeling touched. You're truly a good friend. But as it turned out, I was touched too soon. For a man going through a divorce, having a friend in a passionate relationship around is like a dose of poison. That evening, I waited for him to join me in playing video games. But he took forever to reluctantly hang up his video call with his girlfriend. I put him in a headlock, grumbling. Isn't it a bit much to show off your love in front of me? He shamelessly laughed. I'm just using poison to fight poison. I actually admired him. After being hurt so deeply, he still managed to live so freely. Do you regret loving Lisa? I immediately regretted asking the question as soon as it left my mouth. Hearing that name, Victor didn't show much emotion and simply said, just because a relationship doesn't end well doesn't mean it's a tragedy. I thought deeply about his words. I realized that I didn't need to hate Bianca at 28 for what happened at 18. The girl who once took my breath away was simply gone. I would accept it and slowly let go. Chapter 12. One month later, Bianca and I finalized our divorce. I purchased a vineyard in Montmartre, Paris, 
With the intention of learning winemaking in France, Victor had already settled there and was more than happy to welcome me. On the day I left the country, Bianca and Elias held a grand wedding. The bride wore a custom-made wedding gown, adorned with jewels. I remembered when we got married, we were really poor. Her wedding dress was just a simple white dress that cost only 200 yuan, and the bouquet was made from a cottonwood branch we picked by the roadside. As simple and plain as our love back then, the past gradually faded away, like clouds drifting apart, and everything has changed. I boarded the plane, heading towards a brand new life. Chapter 13 My life gradually became peaceful, and I thought I would never cross paths with Bianca again. Unexpectedly, a year later, I returned home to visit the graves and ran into her once more. Bianca stood in front of my mother's grave, holding a bouquet of white chrysanthemums. When she saw me, there was a flash of surprise in her eyes, and she hoarsely called out, Leonardo. I asked in a low voice, what are you doing here? She took a few steps closer, quickly replying, I was hoping to see you. You sold the house and changed your phone number, and I couldn't find you. I kept my distance from her and coldly asked, do you need something? The mountain wind stirred up some fine sand, and she must have gotten some in her eyes as they started to redden slightly. I just wanted to talk to you. I felt like I was hearing the biggest joke of my life. Bianca, you have a husband now. Leave. You're blocking my parents' graves. She ignored me and stood there motionless. Since I couldn't make her leave, I decided to just ignore her completely. I wanted to explain what happened the night your mother passed away. Bianca continued speaking, not caring whether I wanted to listen or not. She said, I was planning to go out that night, but he stopped me, and I accidentally strained myself. I responded perfunctorily. Oh, she lowered her head, her voice heavy with pain. Leonardo, I'm scared that night. The hand arranging the offerings paused for a moment, but I still didn't say anything to her. After a long silence, she suddenly spoke again. If I had come that night, would you not hate me so much now? I looked up and met her gaze. The sadness in her eyes was unmistakable. I couldn't understand what the point of her expression was now. I quickly looked away, pretending I hadn't seen anything, and lit three sticks of incense for my parents reporting my recent situation to them, telling them that I'm doing very well now. After the memorial, I walked down the mountain, with Bianca following me, suddenly becoming much more talkative. She said we used to watch the flowers on the hillside, the birds in the woods, and the clouds in the sky together. She remembered everything, but Bianca, the flowers on the hillside no longer bloom, the birds in the woods have flown away, and even the clouds in the sky have changed their shapes. Everything has changed. Chapter 14 the house in my hometown was uninhabitable without care, so after spending a night at a hotel in town, I flew back to France. Running into Bianca didn't stir up much emotion in me. Coincidentally, Victor had just launched his own fashion brand and had become very busy. My vineyard had employees to manage it, so I was quite free and spent most of my time in the studio helping him out. I joked, the two of us who studied trade are now a tailor and a winemaker, really not sticking to our professions. He waved his finger, no no no. Life is a process of gradually understanding oneself. During our chats, I asked him, when did you become interested in fashion design? He hesitated for a moment and then quietly answered, when you married Bianca, he said, there was something I never knew. Do you remember the wedding outfits you both wore? The patterns were exquisite, but the price was incredibly cheap. You always thought I got a friend to help out, right? I nodded. He continued, actually, Bianca couldn't bear to spend the money. So she only bought the simplest white dress and suit. But she didn't want you to feel like she was shortchanged. So she drew the patterns herself, then asked my designer friend for help, and slowly embroidered the patterns on. She even made the veil herself. I didn't know she could sew. She couldn't at first, but my friend is amazing. And she's smart. So she learned it in a few days. She didn't want you to feel guilty. So she made me promise not to tell you. He said that back then, he only played a supporting role. But seeing you both in those outfits filled him with a sense of accomplishment. Our thoughts drifted back to the past together, he recalled. On your wedding day, when you lifted Bianca's veil and she saw your face, the way she teared up is something I'll never forget. I was filled with mixed emotions and smiled faintly. She really loved me back then. Victor thought for a moment and then added, Actually, I ran into Bianca a few days ago. I didn't react much, calmly saying, Paris is the city of art, and she's a painter, so it's normal for her to be here. He shook his head. I think she came to find you, the other night. You left something at my place, and when I went to return it, I saw her following you from a distance, just watching, not approaching. I joked, I remember you have night blindness, maybe you mistook someone else for her. Victor angrily retorted, do you think I'm blind? I even talked to her for a bit. Dude, I made sure to tell her about the time you came to Paris to find Mr. Luis. We can't do good deeds without getting credit. I remembered this and gave him a thumbs up. Victor sighed, after she heard that, she just froze. 
Looking lost and a little pitiful, I paused and said, It's no longer my concern. Chapter 15 A particularly capable young woman arrived at my vineyard and took excellent care of my grapes. Thanks to her, the newly brewed wine was of high quality, and I secured a large order. Coincidentally, the client who ordered the wine was hosting a banquet, attended by many celebrities from the art world, including Bianca. When I went to deliver the wine, I encountered her and Elias. Their interaction was strange, with very little conversation between them. Not like a newlywed couple at all. I didn't linger long. I signed the papers and left. When Bianca saw me, she followed me out, and Elias showed little reaction. I was in a hurry, and Bianca jogged to catch up, grabbing my hand. The moment our skin touched, she quickly let go and said, I'm sorry, Bianca, what do you want? Leonardo, I. She hesitated, and I lost my patience. Suddenly, she seemed to remember something, and her dull eyes lit up instantly, I want to paint a landscape of France, could you be my guide? Afraid I would refuse, she quickly added, you can name your price, I replied, I don't need money, she collapsed, her tone almost pleading, Leonardo, can you give me a chance to make it up to you? I looked at her coldly, make up for what? I know about what happened with Luis, I calmly said, you were chosen because of your own talent, and I took your money, we owe each other nothing. Bianca lowered her head and softly muttered, Why didn't you tell me back then? I laughed, Would it have made a difference? The sadness in her eyes was unmistakable, and she stubbornly said, Maybe we wouldn't have ended up like this. I found it ironic, Bianca. Wake up, we were together for so many years, and this is far from the only foolish thing I did for you. Your heart had already left me back then. Nothing I said or did would have made a difference. Besides, I'm not interested in your momentary guilt. Maybe I had once imagined a scene like this where the person who wronged me would finally wake up and regret their actions. But now that the moment had arrived, it didn't feel as satisfying as I thought it would. How did the once stunningly beautiful girl become like this? I paused and said seriously, Bianca, stop making excuses for yourself, or I'll lose respect for you. Her entire body stiffened, and her face was filled with pain. Walk the path you've chosen. With that, I didn't look at her again and walked away without turning back. That night, Victor was working late and asked me to bring him some food. It was already dark, and his studio was in a remote location. Two streetlights on the only path there were out, leaving the entire lane eerily silent. Suddenly, two men armed with knives jumped out from the side of the road, their faces menacing as they robbed me of everything I had on me. I didn't have much money on me, and after they rifled through my bag, they spat out some harsh words in poorly pronounced French, which I couldn't fully understand, and then they threw a punch at me. We ended up in a scuffle, in the chaos. A figure suddenly rushed over and struck one of the assailants on the head with a stone. The knife-wielding thug turned vicious and stabbed the person twice before fleeing in a panic. It all happened so fast that by the time I realized what had occurred, I saw Bianca lying on the ground, covered in blood. I rushed her to the hospital, and the doctor said she had been stabbed in the abdomen. The wound wasn't life-threatening, but the tendon in her right hand had been severed, meaning she might never paint again. Lying in the hospital bed, her face pale. The first thing she asked upon seeing me was if I was hurt. I shook my head, my brows furrowing tighter and tighter. She smiled and tried to comfort me, don't worry, I'm not seriously injured. I hesitated for a long time but eventually told her the truth. The smile on Bianca's face froze for a moment. Then she forced herself to appear cheerful, it's okay, as long as you're fine. But she was never a good actress. She turned her face away, avoiding my gaze, her entire body trembling. I tried to comfort her, the doctor didn't say there's no hope at all, and even if your right hand can't function, you can try using your left hand, there's always a way. She suddenly turned to me, her eyes red as she asked, Leonardo, if I divorce Elias, will we? I interrupted her and said directly, Bianca, there will never be an us again, focus on getting better, don't think about anything else. The despair in Bianca's eyes was all too clear, with tears in her eyes, she pleaded, at least tonight, could you stay with me? I calmly replied. The person who should be by your side now is Elias, not me. But Elias never showed up that night, and in the end, I didn't leave. During Bianca's surgery, I used her phone to call Elias, but no one answered. I later sent him a text, but there was no reply. In the middle of the night, she developed a low fever and started vomiting blood. After another examination, the doctor said she had stomach cancer. It wasn't in the late stages, and with active treatment, there was hope for recovery. I couldn't understand why, with all her money and status. She had let herself deteriorate like this, but I didn't ask. The next afternoon, Elias finally arrived, impeccably dressed and radiant, only concerned with asking the doctor whether Bianca would be able to paint again, without even noticing my presence. I said my goodbyes to Bianca, take care of yourself, I'm leaving. She didn't say a word, lying in bed with a lifeless gaze. Chapter 16 After Bianca's right hand was crippled, 
preventing her from painting. The value of all her work skyrocketed. The announcement of the public auction of her iconic work, Muse, quickly sparked widespread discussion. Back then, Bianca was showcasing her love through that painting, and not long after, she married the men depicted in it, making them a celebrated couple online. The painting, enriched by this romantic love story, became even more valuable and was eventually sold to a collector for an astonishing 50 million yuan. However, within days, an unexpected turn of events occurred. Hashtag Elias sells fake paintings hashtag. Hashtag Bianca commits adultery hashtag. These two hashtags simultaneously topped the trending list. Bianca held a press conference, publicly stating that the original muse had long been destroyed and that the sold piece was a forgery created by Elias. In front of the cameras, she admitted that the romantic tale behind Muse was, in fact, an ugly extramarital affair. She confessed that after achieving success, she abandoned her husband of 10 years. The public was outraged. And soon, Bianca and Elias were the targets of widespread condemnation. Due to Bianca's report, the police launched an investigation into the sale of the fake painting. Not long after, Elias was arrested on charges of producing and selling counterfeit goods. Given the massive amount of money involved, he now faces life imprisonment. After that, Bianca vanished from the public eye. My life, however, continued peacefully, like grass growing on a levee, leaves sprouting on treetops, serene and tranquil. The business at the vineyard flourished, and six months later, I encountered a peculiar customer, a 16-year-old French girl. She would visit every few days to buy wine, specifically requesting the wine I had personally made. With one unique request, she asked me to teach her Chinese, one phrase at a time, carefully recording my words on a voice recorder. Sometimes, it was a simple greeting like, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Other times, it was something different. On Valentine's Day, she came again to buy wine and asked me to teach her how to say, I love you. By then, I had entered a new relationship with the woman who had been taking such good care of my vineyard. I recorded, I love you, as the girl requested. And she suddenly added, I love you too. I affectionately patted her head and turned to my girlfriend to apologize. I added an extra phrase, is that okay? The girl pursed her lips seemingly conflicted, but in the end, she said nothing and left with her wine. That night, I received a call from an unknown number. The caller said nothing, only prolonged silence. I assumed it was a wrong number, and since my girlfriend was calling me to dinner, I hung up. The girl never returned to my vineyard after that. Chapter 17 Bianca's name reappeared in the public eye not long after Valentine's Day. I stared at the trending hashtag, hashtag Bianca's final work hashtag, in a daze for a long time. The news reported that her body had been found in an old farmhouse in France. She had died in misery, afflicted by disease and poverty. Her only possession was a painting titled Eternal Love, depicting a couple dressed in wedding attire. The bride wore a white dress, holding a bouquet of kapok flowers, while the groom gently embraced her. Both their faces were obscured by a veil, blurry and indistinct. Experts hailed it as the best work of Bianca's life. However, the public was more intrigued by whether the artist was reminiscing about a past lover or if she had found a new soulmate. As I gazed at the bouquet in the bride's hands, memories drifted back to the past. The year I married Bianca, the kapok flowers bloomed exceptionally early, and I picked some to bring back, tying them into a bouquet with a colorful ribbon. She asked me, why not roses? I smiled mysteriously and said, because I love the meaning behind kapok flowers. Chapter 18, Bianca's Perspective I married the boy I fell in love with at first sight when I was young, promising to stay together for a lifetime, never parting until old age. Although our married life was frugal, it was still sweet. When did things start to go wrong? Looking back now, it must have been when we lost our first child. That was the first time I felt so deeply the helplessness of life. After that, he became more and more dedicated to his work, calculating every penny, his mind entirely focused on money. My paintings wouldn't sell, so he found another way using his connections to get me commercial commissions. It was like a childhood writing assignment, just paint according to the client's needs. Each piece lacked soul and thought, only aiming to please. I didn't like it, but it was an opportunity he had fought for, so I felt I should cherish it. Our life did gradually improve. I thought we had enough money, but he was never satisfied, constantly working himself to exhaustion, so busy that he didn't even have time to talk to me. He would introduce me to his business friends, skillfully toasting them with, please continue to support us. Those people, out of courtesy, would buy my paintings at high prices, then tease. Bianca, you married a good husband. Honestly, I hated seeing him grovel like that. I felt more and more suffocated, even starting to resent my own art. Later, I met Elias. The way he quietly stayed by my side, watching me paint, was so much like the Leonardo I once knew. He understood me, appreciated my paintings, 
and didn't care only about how much they could sell for. My gray day suddenly gained a touch of color, and I gradually rediscovered my passion and purpose in painting. I admit, I couldn't stop myself from falling for him, I thought. This clean and pure young man was my destined love, and Leonardo and I, we were a mistake from the beginning. On our sixth wedding anniversary, Leonardo discovered our affair, and I made my decision. After leaving Leonardo, I felt relieved. What surprised me even more was that my most admired painter, Mr. Luis, contacted me, asking to meet. He told me that he had seen one of my paintings at a street stall in France and greatly admired my talent. The painting depicted a simple village with a young man standing on the hillside, his back to the viewer, but still vivid. It was a piece I painted when I was 18, which I had given to Leonardo. At the time, he treasured it, but I suppose he sold it when he needed money. That's how he is, money is more important than feelings. It didn't matter anymore. We were getting divorced. With Mr. Luis's support, I successfully held an exhibition. I made it. Even though Leonardo made me leave the marriage with nothing, earning money was now an easy task for me. I held a grand wedding with my new love. I thought this was the life I wanted. But things started to get strange. I frequently dreamed of Leonardo. Sometimes I would wake up in the middle of the night, see the men beside me, and feel a sense of unreality, an emptiness inside. I began pouring my emotions into my work, locking myself in the studio all day. I used to do that often too, but Leonardo would prepare all my meals for me, and even when he was away on business, he wouldn't forget to call and remind me to eat and sleep on time, but Elias didn't care about these things. After we got married, he rarely spent time discussing my paintings with me. When I voiced a complaint, he would storm out and slam the door. I found myself unable to stop missing Leonardo. When dining with Elias in fancy restaurants, I would think of the days when Leonardo and I shared a single meat bun in our cramped apartment. When buying Elias all sorts of expensive gifts, I would remember the first wedding anniversary, when Leonardo had secretly saved up for a long time to buy me a Dior lipstick and an Estee Lauder skincare set. I scolded him for wasting money, yet I was moved to tears. Then I remembered the time of our divorce, when I called him a man who only cared about money, and I suddenly felt as if I had been struck by lightning. I impulsively called Leonardo, but the number was disconnected. I even quietly visited our old home, but it had new owners. I watched the happy family inside. And for a moment, I wondered if I had thrown away a happiness that was within my grasp. I shook my head, quickly dismissing the thought. I reminded myself that my choice was the right one, and it couldn't be wrong. So, I tried even harder to be good to Elias. But life is ironic. Elias had an affair. The real him was nothing like I had imagined. He would send flirtatious photos to other women late at night, affectionately calling them wife, Leonardo. So this is what betrayal feels like. I was truly terrible before. Elias threatened me, saying that if I divorced him, he would make my life a living hell. I couldn't fight back. In just one year of marriage, our life felt like it was in a grave. Chapter 19. I often returned to Leonardo's hometown. No matter where he was, he would always come back here. So maybe one day we would meet. During the Qingming festival, we really did reunite. He looked great. Full of energy and spirit. He was doing well without me. He mentioned his vineyard in France while standing at his parents' graves. I silently kept that in mind. I began frequently flying to another country just to catch a glimpse of him from afar. One day, I ran into Victor, whom I hadn't seen in years, and I learned the truth. It turns out that behind my success was his wholehearted dedication. He hadn't changed. I was the one who had. Over time, I had forgotten our first love and commitment. I once had a great love, but I lost it. This realization tore at my heart. I finally decided to divorce Elias, and he demanded ten times the money Leonardo had asked for. I agreed, but I needed some time. We were both invited to an art exhibition in France, and at the dinner, I unexpectedly saw Leonardo. I couldn't help but want to get close to him. That night, when he was attacked, I didn't think, I just rushed in to save him. He took me to the hospital and even worried about me. It felt so good. If losing a hand could bring Leonardo back, I wouldn't have a word of complaint. But he didn't want to give me that chance. God knows how much I wanted to hold onto him as he walked away. But he left so quickly that I couldn't even grasp a corner of his sleeve. I guess this is my punishment. One day, he will meet someone a thousand times better than me, while I will never find anyone better than him. Chapter 20 After returning home, I was ill for a long time, and during my hospitalization, Elias never visited me, not even once. Soon after, I heard the news that Muse had been auctioned off at a high price, but I had destroyed the painting myself, so the only explanation was that someone had forged it. I went home to confront Elias, only to find two bodies entwined together in our room. It turned out that our marriage was even more sordid than I had imagined. Elias had a long-time girlfriend, who had fallen into bad habits and accumulated a large amount of high-interest debt. He married me just for the money. He proposed a deal, with my right hand crippled. 
I had lost my ability to earn money. If I stayed silent, we could split the profits from the sale of the paintings. Elias confessed that he truly loved that girl, but she owed too much money, and if she couldn't pay it back, it would be the end of her. So he does have a heart, just one that belongs to someone else, even willing to take risks for her. How despicable and pitiful. I held a press conference. Both he and I needed to face the consequences of our actions. On the day of his sentencing, we divorced. By then, he had already emptied my assets, leaving me with nothing once again. I began to try painting with my left hand. The quality of the work was far from what it used to be, but I could still sell some of it on the streets. It took me six months to save enough money to go to France. The doctor said my stomach cancer had advanced to the final stage, and I didn't have much time left. If possible, I wanted to be close to him when death finally came. I rented a dilapidated farmhouse near Leonardo's vineyard. A kind couple lived next door, and they had a lovely daughter. I often asked her to go to Leonardo's place to buy wine for me and record a phrase each time. I desperately wanted to hear his voice again. The wine he brewed was my medicine, letting me momentarily forget the excruciating pain in a drunken haze. I often dreamed of Leonardo, seeing him in a sharp suit, looking at me with gentle eyes, saying, Bianca, we are married. When awake, the intense longing would torment me again and I poured it all into my paintings. It turns out I could still paint Leonardo well with just my left hand. After all, in my youth, I had sketched his features countless times. I painted myself beside him and titled the painting Eternal Love, but Leonardo's eyes stared straight at me, filling me with unease. He must hate those words. So, I used oil paint to add a veil, covering our faces, selfishly placing those words on the painting. If there is a next life, I will never let go of your hand again. I curled up beside the painting. Letting loneliness and despair consume me, Valentine's Day came, and my body had reached its limit. I realized I was about to die. At such a time, I thought I could allow myself one last indulgence. I asked the girl next door to help me record I Love You, but she told me it didn't record successfully. What a pity. That night, I couldn't resist calling Leonardo. What should I say? I hadn't even prepared to speak when I heard a woman's voice. She called his name sweetly, and Leonardo responded with a tone of affection. It was the voice of someone in love a sound I once knew so well, I realized I had finally, completely lost him, he hung up on me, and I coughed up a mouthful of blood, as everything went dark, I saw the bride in the painting lift her veil and look at the groom beside her, she held a kapok flower and asked, why not roses, he smiled mysteriously and said, because I love the meaning of kapok flowers, I suddenly remembered telling Leonardo once, I love kapok flowers the most because their meaning represents the wisdom of love, treasure the ones you love and the happiness before you,